the Romans built the biggest amphitheater ever seen, the Colosseum. It was the focal point of the world's largest city, the capital of an empire. Over a single hundred year period, Rome's population quadrupled. Rome was a modern city in every sense. There were over a million people that lived in this city. With a million people, there come a number of problems, the most pressing of which is water. You really wouldn't choose to build Rome where it is. There are a number of big problems. The first is that it sits on seven hills, and there are no major springs or water sources at the top of these hills. And there is one river, the Tiber. And that is relied upon for not only all the city's fresh drinking water, but it becomes where all the human waste goes, the garbage, and even dead bodies. It became horrendously polluted. So you need another solution. And this map shows the Roman solution. 11 lifelines coming into the city, a network of aqueducts. Roman aqueduct is a vast machine. It can be over 50 miles long. Chris Carroll's team want to see how all its pieces work together, so they've decided to build one of their own. Same obstacles, same problem, same solutions. Just a little smaller. We're going to set up the, uh, the wall line for the aqueduct and then we're going to draw on the concrete with pencil where the wall is going to be and make sure everything's plumb in the ballpark. Even with modern surveying equipment, building an aqueduct is a big job. Chris's team work into the night. A little more, dead on. Yeah, check it again, make sure. Timber form work will give the structure its shape. It's got to be precise. They can only pour the concrete once. Good. Not bad at all. I'm happy with that. The Romans' nearest clean water source was 25 miles from the walls of the ancient city. Steve's come here to see and understand for himself. Getting water back from here means crossing hills and valleys and an open plain. Today we overcome these problems with mechanical pumps and pressurized pipes. This is your end. Thank you. Let's go. All the ancient engineers had to help them was gravity. The fact that the spring is 1,000 feet higher than the city. I think it's incredibly impressive how the Romans supplied water entirely by gravity uh, from the mountains into the city of Rome. The constraints are obvious and they make things tough. The engineers couldn't go over the mountains, so they had to go through them. And then by using a simple fluid level, they had to get the perfect gradient. Dig it too shallow an angle and the water simply wouldn't reach Rome. Too steep and it would erode the walls. The tunnel would collapse. What sort of gradient uh, do these tunnels have to be laid out? The gradient was really very low. We talk about one per thousand so it means one feet every thousand feet that's why they normally had to make an aqueduct that was longer than the real distance keeping that precise gradient meant that the engineers needed in effect to create extra work for themselves building in twists and turns finding a longer route this aqueduct travels 50 miles even though the straight route is just 25. The biggest surprise for me about the aqueducts is the accuracy of construction. And the way they did it is they had surveying checkpoints at about one to 200 feet across the entire length. Between those points, actually, the tunnels can meander and the head height can change you know, quite a lot. But what is consistent is the base flows at that consistent gradient from out here in the mountains right into the city of Rome, 25 miles away. Modern tunnel engineers use large-scale boring machines. Guided by lasers and equipped with diamond-tipped cutting heads, these machines can chew through 250 feet of mountain a day. 
the Romans didn't have machines, just men. And the walls still bear the scars of their labor. We can see very well the signs of the digging. So you can tell the direction they were coming from because they obviously dug with overhand. Exactly. And these are the marks on the wall. So what sort of equipment were they Something use? like a pickaxe. Yeah. And these holes that are in the wall at the top, do we know what they are? These holes were to put light. We must understand that we were in an underground place with no light. So Roman tunneling technology amounted to just a pickaxe and a candle. If they'd simply started at one end and kept cutting, even with teams working round the clock, the tunnels of this aqueduct would have taken something like 1,300 years to complete. So you could only get two or maybe three people working at the tunnel face. would have been very slow progress. So what the Romans did is they excavated along the line both vertical shafts and horizontal shafts. The Romans sank shafts into the mountains every 200 feet. This created multiple work faces, allowing hundreds of men to dig at the same time. The result? The entire project got finished in 12 years. If we were given the problem of building these aqueducts today, the challenge would be exactly the same. The difference would be that today we have much better plants and equipment. Chris and his team have all the equipment they need, but some problems can't be fixed with modern technology. Of course, the ancient Romans had rain too. You got uh, a lot of water, had mass amounts of rain the past couple weeks, which is really slowing down construction progress. The sky's cleared, but the site's now covered with a sea of mud. These are the times when modern machines don't look so clever. There was a, a bobcat that was that got stuck last night, so I think there's some guys working on that this morning trying to get it out. And we uh, had a pickup truck get stuck in the mud. And if it's not four-wheel drive out there, it's probably not going to get out. The team don't have time for stuck trucks. They've got to make new roads and figure out how to drain the site. We're going to dig a hole with a shovel, so that way all the water can drain, and that's where we'll set the pump. So that way all the water will go in, and the pump will take it out. With the water pumped out, they can get back to the business of building an aqueduct. The Romans face theirs with stone. Chris is using wood. This mold must be perfect. If any concrete leaks out, they'll have to start again. They can't afford any more setbacks. The Roman engineers were under pressure with a city crying out for water. Chris has concrete arriving tomorrow. Once again, for about the, the third or fourth night, now we're going to have to work in the darkness so we broke out the lights. Chris's mold uses 200 cubic feet of concrete, but the Roman version is 27 times higher, 3,500 times longer, and transported millions of gallons of water a day. They had years of aqueduct building experience. This is Chris's first attempt. He leaves it to dry in the Louisiana sun. How will it measure up? The Romans used aqueducts to supply the cities of their empire with water. These majestic machines transported water miles from a source in the mountains to the heart of the city. At the test site in Louisiana, the model aqueduct is finally ready. It's three months since Chris poured the concrete, and their miniature marvel contains all the elements you'd find in a bigger Roman version. An aqueduct is so much more than just a bunch of arches through a valley. There's actually five different components past the water source, first one of which is a tunnel. The second is a pipe system, which empties into a covered trench which empties into the exposed portion of the aqueduct, which is the wall, and then the arcade. It's only when you see all the pieces together that you truly understand the engineer's vision and skill. But the terrain between the source and the city doesn't just slope gently downhill. It's marked by steep valleys. The water was able to travel through deep valleys based on a change in elevation in the pipe system. So as you can see behind me, the far hill has a higher elevation, which would create a pressure to push the water through the pipe system and back up the hill nearest to me. 
On the downhill slope, water gains speed and pressure. This forces it up the slope on the other side, a solution that works on any scale. A full-sized aqueduct is a massive feat of construction, but building it is only the start, because once it's up and running, it's never meant to stop. Now, our aqueduct is three months old, but it has already begun to crack because that's what concrete does. Now these are similar problems that the Romans would have encountered with their systems, but this is a reminder to us that it's not just a structure, but this is a machine that supplies water to the city. Steve's come to see the most visible part of the aqueduct, the raised section that traveled the final miles into the city. Are we ready? Yes. The fact it's now ruined means he can see exactly how it worked. And how the engineers planned from the very beginning to ensure that the flow never dried up. So Adriano, we're now right up here at the very top of the aqueduct, at the, the uppermost level. The whole of the construction is pretty visible. I mean, it's like somebody's just cut a big cross-section through yeah, it for us. Yeah, it's a cross-section. It's a perfect cross-section. We're looking at two aqueducts here, one above the other. What's really impressive is that, that they understood the water source, they understood where they were delivering it to, and they understood how to build these structures. But they also had to think through how they maintained them, how they kept up the water quality. No matter how difficult the engineering challenges, the Romans had a solution. It was the water itself which posed the biggest challenge. As in any plumbing system, you get a buildup of mineral deposits. The channels have to be cleaned regularly. This is how they cleaned out the lower aqueduct. What I can see here is stone projecting from the pier. And this only happens on maybe once every eight or nine piers. And I can actually see that some stone has been hacked off in this position here. I think there are two purposes to this buttress. One is a stability system that provides lateral stability to the entire aqueduct. And the second is that it's a staircase where they could actually climb up and get into the lower aqueduct to clean it out. So it's both a means of maintenance and a means of stability. Very Roman in that they built it once and they used it twice. The stone buttresses once reached out about three feet, strengthening the structure. But they also created a staircase, a way to climb the 40 feet to the top. That meant that cleaning teams could always have access, maintaining the flow to the city. Around 300 gallons to every Roman, every day. Almost three times what the average American town supplies to each of its citizens. But the Romans didn't merely rely on water. They loved it. To them, it meant power, success, and luxury. And that idea led to the creation of some incredible buildings. One reveals the solution to a unique engineering challenge. How do you build a bath that will hold 10,000 people.